In this video, I'm going to introduce the factors that predict GDP growth. I'll go through several of these factors, then introduce a GDP growth model, and then finally, I'll discuss how investors estimate the equity risk premium and aggregate stock returns. Now, there are several factors that have been found to predict GDP growth. First, we'll look at the Leading Economic Index, or LEI, which is an index of 10 different leading economic indicators. Then, we'll look at the yield curve. And finally, we'll look at how fiscal and monetary policy can affect GDP growth. The LEI, or Leading Economic Index, is an index containing leading indicators related to economic conditions in several different sectors. Factors such as the average weekly manufacturing hours could indicate the expectations of manufacturers concerning how many units they think they can sell. If they've received many orders or expect higher demand in the future, they'll increase the number of hours their employees work. Another good indicator of the direction in the real estate market is the number of building permits for new private housing units. If real estate developers have performed their due diligence and determined that demand exists for new houses, they'll request building permits. The received permit leads the production and the sale of the home. Another component of the LEI is consumer expectations for business conditions. This is calculated using a survey. If consumers are optimistic about future conditions, this number will rise. Taken together, the LEI is often seen as the broadest leading indicator. The organization that puts it out, the Conference Board, provides the LEI for the U.S. as well as over a dozen countries. So here's the most recent report on the LEI for January of 2022. And in it, the Conference Board announced that the LEI for the U.S. increased in December. If I scroll down, you can see the LEI for the United States, and notice that it tends to lead recessionary periods, which are in gray. So if there's a decline in the LEI, that can often be followed by a recession. So this is why we say that the LEI is a leading economic indicator. It's not perfect, and we don't care so much about the levels as we do about the change in the LEI. So if we see a negative change in the LEI, that is possibly indicative of future headwinds in the U.S. market. The next indicator I want to talk about is the yield curve. The yield curve has been shown to predict real GDP growth. So just to refresh your memory, the yield curve is the graph of the yield on Treasury securities with different maturities. If the curve is increasing, like it is in the blue line, which represents the current yield curve, we have a normal yield curve. If it's declining, we have an inverted yield curve, which is more or less what we have in the gray line indicating the yield curve as of February 2020. An inverted yield curve often indicates or signals a recessionary period ahead. Now, there's some research out there, uh, notably by Hobrish and Dombrowski, 1996, that shows that the differences in spot rates between each Treasury securities maturity can predict economic growth. The reason spot rates tend to predict economic growth is because those spot rates, the these S sub 1, S sub 2, uh, they indicate the future short-term rates. So if short-term rates in increase, that tends to indicate that market conditions are increasing. Maybe the, the Fed has had to increase uh, interest rates to uh, control inflation. Uh, so let's take a look at an example. So... If the one-year spot rate is 2% and the two-year forward rate is 3%, uh, then the one-year rate starting one year from now has to be f about 4%. Uh, so the equation we use is this one. So we have 1 plus our forward rate, so the, the rate over the next two years uh, squared has to be equal to 1 plus the spot rate this year times 1 plus the spot rate next year. So if we know that the current rate on a one-year T-bill is 2%, and we know the forward rate right now for a two-year uh, treasury is 3%, we can back out the yield on a one-year treasury starting one year from now. And that yield, that 4%, that gives us an indication about the risk-free rate going forward. So obviously, 
the 4% rate is greater than the current 2% rate, what this might indicate is even after you take out the maturity risk premium, it's likely that interest rates in the future are going to be higher than they are today, indicating that maybe the Fed has increased rates to control inflation. Basically, this is, this is a good thing. To further illustrate Hobrich and Dombrowski's findings, here's a snapshot of their paper, including the regression of real GDP growth on the yield spread between the 10-year and the three-month uh, treasuries. Notice the positive and significant coefficient on the spread. Uh, so you can see that right here. Uh, so they're regressing the real GDP growth on a spread, basically the 10-year rate minus the three-month rate, and they're finding that there's a positive relationship between the spread and growth in the future. So what this indicates is that a 1% change in the spread has about a 97.9 .9 basis point impact on real GDP growth. So essentially, the larger the spread, the greater the future GDP growth. This is a very impactful finding. Fiscal policy can also impact GDP growth. Increases in federal spending increase the G portion of the famous GDP formula, thus increasing GDP. So here's our famous GDP calculation. It indicates that GDP, or Y, equals our uh, consumer spending plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. So if we see an increase in, the fiscal, in fiscal spending, that's going to increase G thus increasing uh, overall GDP, indicated by Y here. Now, the way in which the government increases spending can have a disparate effect on certain industries. If tomorrow Congress declares war on Russia, defense spending would likely increase, and many government contractors providing military support or doing business with prime government contractors would likely benefit. If the increase in spending involves payouts to individuals, as was the case in 2020 during the start of the COVID-19 outbreak in the U.S., businesses that provide goods and services to individuals would likely prosper. Now, the expectation of changes in public policy will also drive the returns in different industries. Different political parties are more amenable to spending in different industries. For example, when Donald Trump became president in 2016, the private prison industry saw very positive returns. Meanwhile, when Joe Biden won election in 2020, renewable energy firms saw very high returns around the period of the election. These returns reflect changing investor expectations about the opportunities for these firms in the macroeconomic environment. Monetary policy will also affect macroeconomic conditions. Central banks like the Federal Reserve are often tasked with targeting an inflation rate or reducing unemployment. For example, the Federal Reserve has a 2% inflation target. The Fed has three primary tools to adjust interest rates. First, it can buy and sell government bonds using open market operations. This is the most often used tool of the Fed. When the Fed buys bonds, it pushes the price of the bonds up and interest rates down. The investors that sell those bonds are now liquid and can invest that cash they just received when they sold their bonds. In practice, the Fed has, at several times in recent years, bought other assets in addition to government bonds. This process is often referred to as quantitative easing. The Fed can also adjust the discount rate at which banks can borrow from regional Fed branches. If the Fed wants to control inflation, it can increase the discount rate. If it wants to stimulate economic growth, it can lower the discount rate. Finally, the Fed can adjust the reserve requirement for banks. U.S. banks have to hold 10% of their deposits in vaults or Fed branches. If the Fed wants to control inflation, it can increase the reserve requirement. If the Fed wants to stimulate economic growth, it can decrease the reserve requirement, which would allow banks to lend more to borrowers. The Fed rarely adjusts this reserve requirement for banks, though. Now, as investors, we need to keep an eye on fiscal and monetary policy in an economy. Many central banks and legislators will give talks or provide information beyond the basic statistics. So reading reports and listening to speeches by policymakers is important for predicting how fiscal and monetary policy will change. Now, there are some formal models that attempt to predict the change in GDP growth. Unfortunately, 
these aren't perfect, but one of the most important models out there is the Cobb-Douglas production function. The Cobb-Douglas production function says that the percentage change in GDP should be equal to the long-term growth rate in technology, or theta, plus the alpha times the long-term growth rate of capital, plus one minus alpha times the long-term growth rate of labor. Now, this alpha and one minus alpha, these represent the share of income paid to either capital or labor in an economy, and these are sometimes just ballparked or estimated. The long-term growth rate in technology, though, this is an estimate of the effect of growth in technology. In economies that are rapidly advancing technologically, this value is going to be pretty high. The long-term growth rate in capital is higher when capital is flowing more rapidly into the economy. And the long-term growth rate in labor is higher when the total number of labor hours worked is growing rapidly. Now let's take a look at the factors affecting labor hours in more detail. The biggest driver of the long-term labor growth rate is demographics. If a country has a large population increase, there will likely be more workers in the economy, thus driving the growth rate of labor upward. However, the age of the population is also important. For example, if a country has a lot of elderly people, those people are less likely to be full-time workers. The same is true for children. Now, normally what we like to see is a population pyramid, which details the percentage of the population by age, like this, where it's, it almost looks like a pyramid. So this is the population pyramid of the United States, where uh, there are very few people who are 100 or more. Uh, you have a relatively large population that's between the ages of 20 and 50, and then it just kind of narrows as you go up as, you know, as people die. In other countries, that pyramid looks a lot different. In Saudi Arabia, this is the population pyramid. Notice that there's a lot smaller portion of the population who are elderly. I mean, total, there might be 10%, 15% of the population aged greater than 55, but you have a significant number of males in this uh, between 25 and uh, 50 age range. Usually, we like to see an equal percentage of males and females in the same age range. Uh, this disparity indicates some things that I, I really would prefer not to talk about on an economics video. Now, if I look at Japan, you're going to notice something very unusual. Uh, so Japan, as of 2020, didn't really have a, you know, the, the traditional pyramid we like to think of. Its pyramid is actually flipped, where you have a very large percentage of the population who are elderly or greater than 40 years old. I mean, you have a largest percentage of the population is either uh, between 45 and 49 or 70 to 74. This is something you don't really like to see in a country. It indicates that you have a lot of people that are retirement age or soon to retire, and you have a very, very small percentage of the population who are uh, relatively young. I mean, it's going to be the people who are age 20 to 40 who are the, the most productive members of society. Usually we say uh, between 25 and 45, that's your most productive years as a person. Uh, so this is a little concerning. Uh, this is one of the biggest issues in Japan right now, uh, the fact that they have s such a very, very low birth rate. This is something that should concern us as portfolio managers or analysts. It indicates that the labor hours worked in the future are likely going to fall. Now, other factors like the number of eligible workers or labor force participation can also affect labor growth. For example, historically in many countries, women were not allowed to work outside the home, and obviously preventing half the working age population from being workers outside the home decreases the total labor hours in an economy that's not ideal. The average number of hours worked per week will also influence labor growth. The number of hours worked varies by country and year. In some countries, like Denmark, full-time workers work as little as 37.2 hours per week on average, whereas in countries like Colombia, full-time employees work an average of 49.8 hours per week. The number of hours worked also depends on the sector. 
For example, in the tech sector in China, many employees work 996, meaning from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. Finally, immigration plays a large role in the labor supply. Countries that allow immigration tend to have higher labor growth rates. For example, Gulf countries like Bahrain and the UAE have relatively low populations. Much of the work performed in these countries is done by migrants from India and other countries along the Indian Ocean coast. So what you're looking at is the percentage of the working population that are immigrants. On the other hand, Japan rarely grants visas to migrant workers. So notice here that the percentage of migrants as a portion of the working age population is very, very low for Japan, which, coupled with their declining birth rate, is a serious concern. It indicates that one of the primary tools that populations usually use or countries usually use to increase their labor hours uh, is not being used by the country of Japan. Uh, there is a concerted push in Japan to employ more robots, but the question is whether that will actually be effective. Now, the big takeaway from this discussion is that countries that have a large percentage of young workers, longer average work hours, and low immigration standards tend to have a higher labor growth rate than countries with older populations, shorter work hours, and strict immigration standards. So that's the labor growth rate portion of the Cobb-Douglas production function. Now let's take a look at the capital factors that affect economic growth. Let's start with human capital. Now, human capital refers to the skills and knowledge of a potential workforce. A highly skilled workforce is likely to be more valuable than an unskilled workforce. This is why public education is so valuable for information-based economies. If your workers can't do basic math and can't read, they're limited in their job opportunities. Next, we have physical capital. And physical capital refers to the factories, machines, and other property owned in the country. A firm that's building a new factory is increasing the physical capital of the firm. Obviously, an increase in physical capital means increasing the GDP. Technical investment involves investment in research. U.S. firms often report R&D spending on their income statements, but governments will often sponsor R&D spending. For example, SBIR grants, or SIBR grants, assist small businesses in developing new technology that can be used to generate additional sources of revenue. Finally, we have public infrastructure. Public infrastructure includes the roads, internet cables, telephone lines, ports, and rail lines running throughout a country. If an area has a lack of roads, any firm looking to open a new factory could need to build such roads to transport the goods that they produce to market. That can prevent firms from opening new factories in an area. Generally, infrastructure is best developed and regulated by the state or the, the federal government, since private firms will often only develop the infrastructure they use and then attempt to deny any access to such infrastructure to the general public. Government investments in infrastructure will lower the cash outflows necessary by private firms, thus incentivizing them to develop new physical capital. This is why, when the infrastructure plan was passed by the Biden administration in 2021, the expected growth rate in the United States increased, according to most economic analysts. Altogether, development of the types of capital I have listed here can increase the GDP growth rate of an economy. Skilled workers are often more productive than unskilled workers. More physical capital allows for greater production. Investments in technology can yield new tools that are better than what we were using before. And infrastructure spending reduces costs for private businesses, which can stimulate further investment. There are some other factors to consider when assessing GDP growth. The first is the presence of natural resources or other competitive advantages. For example, Saudi Arabia was a relatively poor desert nation with a very small economy prior to the discovery of oil in the 1930s. Since then, the country has become one of the wealthiest nations on earth. Approximately 90% of the country's economy is in some way tied to the oil industry, which could represent a serious risk as the country moves away from oil. So this is a plot of the country's GDP 
uh, through time, starting in 1968 and then all the way through the present. So obviously it's uh, magnified many, many times over. These are in billions of dollars. The country's population has grown tremendously in the last several decades, and the regime has been attempting to diversify the economy away uh, into tourism and other sectors under its Vision 2030 plan. However, this Vision 2030 plan, which has been put into place by MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, has really only seen minimal success, in part due to the lack of strong property rights, uh, weak rule of law, and then also the very public murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, whose death spooked many investors. So this brings up the issue of something called the resource curse. Uh, the resource curse is a well-known phenomenon where a resource-rich country fails to grow as fast as other countries despite large amounts of natural resources. Uh, countries like Angola, Venezuela, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo are frequently cited as examples of resource-rich countries failing to develop despite the presence of oil or diamonds in the country. The reasons for why these countries don't tend to develop faster than their neighbors tend to vary, but often the regime in power tends to focus on extracting the resources in question at the expense of the development of other industries. The regime is able to remain in power due, in part at least, to its control of the natural resource, while other members of the population remain impoverished, which can lead to political instability and corruption. In many cases, such as in the case of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, that instability can lead to coup attempts and civil war, which often is not very good for any investments in an area. Now, in other countries, the government could support a certain industry, which can be beneficial for investors in that industry. A good example of this is the Chinese government's support of the solar panel production industry. China is one of the largest consumers of coal and other fossil fuels, which has led to serious pollution concerns. As a result, the central government has directed massive investments in solar and wind farming. These investments have led to a significant decline in the production cost of solar panels manufactured in China. As a result, many U.S. solar panel producers have defaulted on their bonds. Unless a U.S. solar panel manufacturer can overcome the significant cost advantage that Chinese solar panel producers possess, it's unlikely a U.S. solar panel manufacturer will be able to survive in a free market. The takeaway here is that understanding factors beyond just basic statistics is important for predicting future economic conditions. Being able to more accurately estimate the likelihood of a policy change can mean the difference between outperforming and underperforming the benchmark portfolio. That's why the most important thing you can do beyond just collecting macro data is to read everything you can related to macroeconomic conditions around the world. Market and industry conditions often depend on relationships between countries and the favorable policies of the political regimes in those countries. Now, you should be able to use resources like Bloomberg, the IMF, the World Bank, and the FRED database to collect data. However, there are many good outside resources available. I often listen to the podcasts put out by the Financial Times, which touch on macroeconomic conditions. I also listen to a lot of regulatory roundtables uh, put out and hosted by U.S. government agencies, where the agency will often have guest speakers talk about market and industry conditions. Just as I've developed my own go-to resources, as prospective investors, you should develop the resources that you trust. However, keep in mind that the source of a statistic matters. I could give many examples of this, but sometimes statistics are a bit inaccurate. Governments around the world have been known to use faulty techniques to improve the statistics of their country, or just flat out lie, just make up numbers. Uh, if you want an example of this, go read about the Greek debt crisis from 2009 to 2011. In that case, the Greek government had been improperly reporting its government deficit and debt. The newly hired head of the Greek statistics office, named Andreas Giorgio, revised the 2009 Greek deficit and debt statistics to appropriately reflect the national debt under the EU's reporting guidelines. Giorgio received many threats and faced backlash from politicians and other Greek statisticians. 
He was charged with economic crimes and having harmed the national interest, a crime that carried a 10-year prison sentence. He was eventually acquitted and has received many different awards from statistics organizations around the world for upholding the highest professional standards while being under pressure to inappropriately report statistics. Now, to avoid issues like relying on inaccurate statistics, I recommend giving greater consideration to trusted sources of information, especially the World Bank and the IMF if you're dealing with international data. If you're dealing with U.S. data, any federal agency is usually fine. Now, here are some additional resources to help you keep tabs on upcoming economic announcements. Knowing when such information will be released is important, so you should have an economic calendar at your disposal. On days when quarterly GDP in the U.S. or changes in the open market operations of the Fed are announced, you can expect significant market volatility. Now, I want to switch topics and talk about how investors often estimate the equity risk premium, or as it's often known, the market risk premium, which is the amount by which the market index will outperform the risk-free asset. Different investors use different strategies for predicting this. The most common strategies for predicting the equity risk premium are the ones I have listed. First, you could calculate the historical equity risk premium and use that to estimate expected stock returns. The average market risk premium in the U.S. has been about 6% or 6.5% over the last 100 years, so many investors choose to use a risk premium of 6% in their models as a default. The second approach is to survey investors or portfolio managers and then take an average or median of their estimates. You could also use the implied approach. Implied approaches rely on a well-known model like the dividend discount model. You estimate all of the components of the model and then solve for the required return on equity and subtract the risk-free rate from that. The formula I have here is the one used by Aswath Damodara, the professor who literally wrote the book on valuation. He's a professor at NYU, and this is one of his techniques to estimate the market risk premium. Finally, there are some custom approaches out there. Some firms develop their own proprietary models to predict the market risk premium. And unfortunately, we don't know exactly what those are because they're proprietary models and no firm is going to disclose that and give another firm the advantage of all their hard work. Now, if you're wondering which of these models works the best, Professor Damodaran has a recent paper where he examines each method using data from 1960 to 2019. He calculates the risk premium using several well-respected models, including the model I just showed you on the last slide, and he compares those models to future returns and future risk premia. The findings here indicate that the model that best predicts future returns and future premia is the current implied premium from the model I just showed you on the previous slide. While our correlation coefficient is significant at the 5% level, indicated right here, uh, it's only a correlation coefficient of 0.55. Also, notice from this table that the historical risk premium uh, is actually negatively correlated with future returns. This indicates that we certainly, well, we, we probably shouldn't use this premium in our forecasts. Now, there are two additional factors I want to mention that have been found to predict returns. The first is aggregate short interest. Short interest is the number of shares shorted by investors. Frequently, we scale this by the number of shares outstanding to create a short interest ratio. If a lot of investors are shorting securities, this indicates they believe the value of those assets is likely to decline. The aggregate short interest ratio has been found by Rapash, Ringenberg, and Joe uh, to negatively be correlated with future returns. In other words, if short interest increases, actual future returns are likely to decrease. The final statistic I want to draw your attention to is the return on the U.S. market. In 2013, Rapash, Strauss, and Joe published a paper demonstrating that U.S. stock returns lead the returns in other markets. The reason for this is likely the speed of information diffusion, uh, although this could also be due to the fact that if U.S. firms experience good market conditions, consumer and investor sentiment could rise 
increasing demand for goods, and then foreign firms supplying many of those goods are likely to benefit, thus increasing the returns on uh, the, the equity of those firms. So let's conclude. We talked about the fact that many statistics offer some predictive ability of GDP growth, the equity risk premium, or just stock returns. We also talked about the importance of reading uh, to get a sense of where macroeconomic conditions are headed. So reading uh, things like the Fed minutes from the, F, uh, the Federal Open Market Committee meetings, uh, reading news articles, reading policy briefs, all of these could offer you additional insights that can be used to construct an estimate of future economic growth. And then finally, I, I do have to unfortunately say that even our best models tend to offer relatively low predictive ability. This is just the nature of the beast. And so with that, I'll conclude, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me either by phone or by stopping by my office hours or by email, and I will probably see you on the next video. Thank you.